Um, today's speaker is Don Seop Wing, um, who is in um, who is a postdoc uh, scholar in current institute at New York University. Um, just to introduce uh, our speaker today briefly, he previous his postdoc uh, position, he was a um, CHU assistant professor at Columbia University, and he received his PhD in applied math at the University of uh, Washington under uh, the professor um, Randy Levitt and co-advised by um, Gunder Ullman uh, in math department. Uh, today, um, Don Seop uh, is going to talk about instilling nonlinear shock waves, nonlinear model reduction for transport dominated problems using deep neural networks. So please enjoy. Um, no, with, with, with no further ado, Don Seop, uh, here you go. Um, All yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction and the invitation. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, model reduction for transport dominated problems. And uh, as is well known, uh, transport dominated problems are, or, or you know, similarly moving interface problems and whatnot are kind of hard to handle with traditional uh, reduced uh, models. And uh, me and uh, my collaborators, we've been looking at ways to remedy that. And uh, we believe that uh, the, there's a particular deep neural network that we could use to overcome this problem. Um, so to just to set the background, um, um, here's the here's the outline. So um, I'm not sure if I could get through all of all of these uh, bullets, but uh, first I'm going to discuss um, when exactly low rank uh, representation, linear low rank representations, which are crucial for classical reduced models, are limited, um, and how we can turn to nonlinear uh, low dimensional representations. Um, and I'm going to discuss very special cases where there is actually a very simple way to, to achieve, to construct these low dimensional representations. And then we will talk about a depth separation in model direction in, in the second part. Um, so this is where I will mention that these nonlinear representations we're constructing uh, in the first bullets uh, can be written in terms of uh, uh, um, deep neural networks with a certain architectural structure, and how these could be used to um, uh, reduce uh, uh, construct reduced models even for, even when there's uh, shock waves present. And in the third, uh, in the later part, uh, if I could get to it, is uh, I'm going to discuss a little bit about what's called the lax Phillips representation. Um, so the first half of the talk is going to be restricted to spatial dimension one, where things are, um, as you will see, it's, it's complicated already, um, but. There, I believe there is a hope to extend these results to multiple spatial dimensions using a generalization of the slack Phillips representation. And um, these representations actually require a certain integral transform called the radon transform. And um, I'll briefly, very briefly, discuss uh, a certain discretization uh, of the radon transform that I've been looking into, which is called the approximate discrete radon transform ADRT. Um, and uh, unlike the Fourier transform, the discretizations of the radon transform is far from a settled matter. And uh, um, I believe that uh, this new discretization, uh, relatively new discretization, has, has lots of desirable properties that might help us in extending um, our, our, our results to multi -sp multiple spatial dimensions. And uh, please feel free to uh, stop me at any time and ask me questions. And uh, uh, my camera tends to flicker sometimes, and it, it might add like a green or purple hue. Um, it's a camera issue that I have, uh, so please be warned about that. And I apologize. Uh, okay, so here's a one slide summary of what uh, model reduction tries to achieve. So in scientific computing, um, we tend to write our approximation to the solution as a linear combination of some basis functions. So these var v's could be, you know, finite element hat functions, um, or in the finite volume case, they could be jump functions, um, and so on. So taking these uh, linear combination of some um, um, basis function, basis vectors or functions, var v sub n, in belonging to some dimension, 
uh, I mean, uh, a finite dimensional space, uh, a linear space uh, of dimension capital NS. We tried to solve uh, some uh, residual minimization problem, uh, which I can summarize here. So roughly speaking, um, the finite element volume difference methods could be uh, considered as solving this type of a problem. Um, here T is uh, uh, for time, um, so we'll be considering mostly time-dependent problems. Um, and, uh, however, for many query problems um, and inverse problems, UQ or machine learning, you typically require this solve uh, upwards of 10,000 times for various uh, parameter dimensions. Um, and uh, it is infeasible to actually sample the solution that many times. Um, I guess uh, if you had a large enough computer, then you might be able to do it and a small enough problem, but usually it's not practical to do so. So um, to, uh, a way to get around this is to construct reduced models that is cheap to compute by projecting to a low dimensional subspace called the reduced spaces. So I guess uh, uh, I'm not sure if how familiar the audience is with the, the reduced model, but I guess uh, um, so all, all you need to do is project your solution to this uh, new dimension, new, new basis, uh, C sub N, that belongs to a much lower dimension. So these bases will be N sub R dimension as opposed to the full model being N sub F dimension. And this, this uh, number of bases here is, should be much smaller than the number of dimensions of the full model. So you derive a, a corresponding residual uh, for, for the reduced system. And solving this gives you a reduced solution, which hopefully matches the, is close enough to the full solution, so that you can you can uh, solve this small, much smaller system, uh, as opposed to solving a large, uh, complicated system. So you can sample this reduced system 10,000 times, and hopefully uh, that'll be a good approximation to sampling the full model. Um, okay. So, but for transport-dominated problems, here's a very simple example where this this uh, fails miserably. And it's the simplest example. So consider the transport equation in 1D, and you have an initial condition, which is uh, this hat function in green. And so the solution is just this uh, hat function traveling to the right. And suppose you sample this uh, at a certain time interval, uh, given here, 0 0.13 and 5 and 7 and 6, and the supports are not even overlapping here. So these functions, these, these snapshots, uh, these solutions are taken at different times, are even orthogonal to each other. So if this pulse was narrow enough in your domain large enough, then you'll end up with a completely orthogonal set of snapshots. And therefore, a low, low dimensional uh, reduced spaces cannot exist um, if you want a certain, uh, a certain accuracy for your problem. So this, uh, this is a, perhaps a familiar, uh, familiar objectivity uh, notion. Uh, if you're familiar with reduced spaces, the cohomograph n width is uh, the best error that you can achieve with uh, uh, a basis of dimension n. Um, so suppose your your this curly m is your solution manifold with a collection of solutions for your PDE that depends on time and parameter, um, and you want to approximate this uh, every member uh, in this the solution manifold by a linear combination of some uh, some some basis functions uh, uh, basis functions of dimension n. So you take a, a member of the uh, reduced spaces and you try to approximate uh, all of the members as much as possible. And uh, you want to approximate all of them with some, some error. And that error, uh, with a, uh, when you're using a, a basic reduced spaces of six dimension n, is given by the n width. Uh, this call over of n width tells you um, how, uh, how well you can approximate your solution manifold uh, with the with the linear basis of dimension n. So, for example, if you have a dk of your n width that is exponential, uh, with decaying in respect to n, then you it means that you have a very good basis function uh, available. But uh, so if you Olbergar and Rabe and Garrett Welker uh, showed for this very simple example, so as opposed to a hat moving, now you have like a jump moving. Um, in this case, you can actually analytically bound the, the lower bound, the n width. So the n width here uh, decays uh, like this, n to the minus a half. Uh, and this is a very slow rate. And when you have this uh, uh, slow rate, it means that no matter how well you, can, you try to construct a reduced basis representation, uh, you, you, you are about to fail. 
However, uh, so there is a there still is a, a low dimensional structure available for these these types of problems, um, which is uh, if you look at that, that that becomes apparent when you look at the characteristic curves. So uh, it is it is well known um, the the one D transport equation the solution is given by uh, the method of characteristics. So you have x t is just the u naught composed with x minus t. So while the solution manifold itself is not low rank, if you look at the characteristic curves, it's x minus t, you can view as a, a, some, some inverse of a diffeomorphism, so, or inverse of a map that transforms the, the, the domain to itself. And so this t sub t is just a representation of a, a characteristic curve emanating from point x. And this uh, x minus t can be represented as a inverse map of uh, x plus t, right? So I guess uh, I can't see anybody's faces, so I'm not sure if people are finding this too too, too simplistic. But uh, so this x plus t, if you if you kind of uh, multiply by one, then you can see that this is actually a low. It has a low rank representation in terms of space. So it's just the identity times some coefficient that depends on t, um, and uh, the, ident the identity map x uh, uh, multiplied by 1. So constant constant 1 times t and identity times 1. So this this uh, capital T sub t, which represents uh, the character curves propagating forward, uh, has a low rank representation, although the solution manifold itself does not. And um, in, a, in a very, very simple case, uh, uh, when you when your characteristics uh, curves are very smooth and they are very very regular, you can represent this with a very small number of terms. So you you do obtain some sort of a low dimensional representation of your solution. And um, so in a very simple case, in a very simple special case, you can actually construct this uh, approximate this capital T sub T uh, very efficiently. Um, for a class of scalar conservation laws uh, using using what's called the DIP maps, uh, which I'll, I'll mention a little bit here. So this is a very uh, special case when this capital T sub T can be constructed very very analytically without uh, without a lot of approximation. So what you try to do here is that this pulse, uh, which is the uh, initial condition at zero, is traveling to the right. You do what's called a monotone decomposition. So you take these uh, monotone parts. So you express your initial condition and your uh, solution at the later time as some of these uh, monotone functions. So uh, and once you've done that, these monotone functions they correspond to certain cumulative distribution functions. So you can kind of uh, you can apply uh, what's called a, a monotone rearrangement map that takes uh, this distribution to this distribution. And distribution to distribution. So um, this only really works in the case that the monotone parts are matching. So I guess if you have a, a monotone increasing part and a decreasing part, and uh, uh, at, at time zero, and the same is true for all future times or parameters, then you can apply this math. Um, and this math, uh, if you uh, this this is monotone rearranged map, which is a term that comes from optimal transports gives you uh, snapshots of these uh, uh, transports. And once you've done that, you, these transport maps, which are, you know, um, you, you, uh, you're, you take your monotone function and then you compose it with the, the inverse of the monotone function at another time, um, you can take an SCD of these uh, approximate transport maps. And uh, you can see that the, while, the, while the original TOD of the solution manifold has a very slowly decaying um, singular values, uh, the, the transport modes themselves actually have a fast, uh, fast DK in their singular values. Um, and a similar notion can be constructed. So, so let me just uh, briefly mention that you can also interpolate um, using these uh, transport maps. And uh, so these uh, transport maps are approximate, but they are approximate to, they are approximations to the true uh, characteristic curves. So, for example, if you take a Burgess equation uh, with this uh, initial condition and then you evolve it forward, and then you construct these transport maps and interpolate them between them, then they actually match up um, exactly. So, they are uh, these transport maps actually approximate 
the, the characteristic curves. Okay, so um, I mean that's a briefly case brief case when when these transport maps could be constructed very very explicit. Um, but uh, regardless of that, what we've done is this is the the classical reuse model where you're taking a linear combination of some basis function, and uh, we've turned it into a nonlinear representation where your basis function is changing over time. So these C's are your usual uh, POD modes, for example. You are composing it that with uh, uh, these low rank transport maps. So you're composing these uh, basis functions with the inverse of these uh, transport maps. And this transport map, which approximates these uh, uh, characteristic curves, is, is a low rank object. So in an essence, what we're doing is we're taking the solution manifold, and instead of trying to construct a one uh, set of linear bases that approximate all the members of, of the solution manifold, um, what you're doing is you're constructing a local basis for a very local portion of your manifold, let's say your initial condition or, or perturbation of your initial condition. And you're applying this uh, transport map, which will generate another transported basis. So you're constructing an adapted basis because uh, this, when you compose uh, your usual reduced basis with the transport map, then you, you can end up with a basis that is very different. Um, and so, for example, if you have a time-dependent problem, then applying this transport map will propagate your reduced basis uh, to, along with the flow um, so that you can represent the solution um, uh, well at all times. Okay, so so um, this is a very again a very simple representation that could be used to construct reduced models, um, and we call uh, this reduced model uh, MAT manifold approximation by transported uh, spaces. Um, so as you have seen before, uh, in a very special case, you can construct these transport modes, or 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 you can solve a minimization to obtain these. And once you have this transported subspace, uh, what's nice is that all the interpolation methods, like the uh, uh, empirical interpolation methods, they require knowing only the uh, your, your sampling your your reduced model at only a, a, a certain a small set of spatial locations. And this this still applies when you apply the transport map. So these interpolation points, um, where you can evaluate these reduced spaces to obtain your coefficients, um, are going to be transported along with with your uh, with your transport map. So as you change the reduced spaces along the flow, your interpolation uh, points will move along with the uh, exactly with respect to these uh, transport maps. So not only do you get uh, a single basis with the corresponding empirical uh, interpolation points, you get uh, a transported basis and corresponding interpolation points for the change basis. So uh, you you have a family of reduced spaces along with uh, corresponding interpolation. Um, so what's nice about this representation is that you can now uh, evaluate and manipulate your reduced model in a very, very uh, cheap way. So what you can say is uh, you can time step this uh, nonlinear reduced uh, representation. Um, and uh, the, I'll, I'll limit the details. The details are uh, in our paper from 2019. And uh, so what you can do is you can alternate evolving the coefficients of your reduced spaces and the coefficients of your transport map in sort of a, a semi-Lagrangian method. So it's a semi-Lagrangian in the sense that you're changing the, the by, by applying the transport map, you're morphing the domain. But you're morphing the domain in a, a very, very specific and low rank manner. So that can be done uh, by only sampling the transport map at uh, these uh, two, two interpolation points. Um, so by alternating uh, the update of your bases and your coefficients, you can, you can solve a, 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 you can solve a, a parametrized PD. Um, so let's look at an example. So here is a, a, a transport equation with a very, very uh, smooth speed. So C here is um, a speed that is uh, some constant modulated by two sinusoidal waves. And so the coefficient here it controls the amplitude. Here mu2 and mu3 controls the, the frequency of, of the modulation. Um, this equation is also called the color equation, representing dyes going on the going. Uh, uh, die uh, being transported uh, along the flow. 
So if you start it with the initial condition that looks like this, as it's traveling, it's not only going to travel to the right, like the advection equation, but its shape is also going to undergo change. Um, so although this is a very simple uh, problem uh, to, to solve with the full model, it's actually hard to implement in um, the classical. Um, so let me give, give you a brief analysis of this problem. So you can um, actually lower bound the, the end width of this uh, solution manifold, just as we provided lower bound for the simple case of a jump moving. You can define what's called the sharply compacted class functions. I, I will not go into the details, but essentially uh, you look at the regularity of uh, what, what's moving. So here is a half sharply compacted class of functions, which is where there's a jump, there's a strict jump that's moving to the right. We saw that the, the end width of that was lower bound by the identity minus half. For example, if you have a slightly more regular problem where, where um, you're your solution doesn't have a jump, but its der derivative does, for example, then you have what's called the three over two sharply convective class function. And in that case, you get a slightly faster distance. So whenever you have an alpha sharply convective function, the n width of that manifold is going to be lower bounded by n minus, uh, n, n minus uh, n to the power to minus alpha. Okay, so for this problem, you can actually show that uh, when your initial condition, it has a discontinuity uh, at some derivative. So it's continuous uh, up to the S minus one derivative, but not the S derivative. Then there is a lower bound of the decay of N to the minus uh, S over two. Um, so for example, uh, this hum, which is, uh, which is a uh, piecewise analytic function where you're combining a uh, cosine, for example, um, with a constant function on the left and the right. So this, this uh, yellow initial condition um, shows uh, this continuity if you take this, the derivative point. So this uh, will, will give you n to the minus three over two dk, which is also pretty slow. Um, you'd like it to decay exponentially for classic, classical use models. Too. However, uh, the the C that we had earlier, which, which was a, a, a constant plus analytic functions, the the, the 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 variable speed itself is actually very very smooth, which implies that the characteristics themselves are uh, also smooth. And so you can actually uh, uh, find a polynomial approximation that that does very very well. Uh, it gives you a spectral accuracy. So the end width of the characteristic curves for this case actually decays very fast. It decays geometrically with respect to that. So you can you can actually construct uh, uh, the, the representation that we had earlier. So uh, well, well, this is probably an exciting uh, for 1D, 1D example, um, we can evolve uh, to reduce spaces. And what we are, when we are solving this evolution equation, we are really only doing computations at these red dots. So although the, the field is uh, uh, it builds up the whole space and it actually um, has degree of freedom like two to the two to the ten or something. And evolving this uh, entire field, you are only if doing computations that uh, that scale with uh, uh, the number of these red dots. So you are able to represent this uh, uh, relatively complicated moving way by by doing computation at this point. And these points are the interpolation points that are moving along with the flow. And this flow, uh, 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 if you, if you uh, track, uh, if you plot the trajectory of these interpolation points, then you can see that they, they are close to the, the characteristic curves um, themselves. And you can look at this, you can vary the dimension of your reduced spaces uh, and how many transport modes you keep. And you can, you can see that the basis size is a, um, with, with 10 basis functions composed with the full transport modes, you can actually represent this moving way. And um, as you can see, if you in, into, uh, in this plot, we show the difference in speed. And if we, even if we increase the, the resolution of this grid on which represents these basis functions, the, uh, the, the runtime per time step for, for this match representation, this nonlinear this model, of course, does not increase. Because the number of uh, interpolation points you see and the uh, number of basis size and your transport mode is is uh, is uh, more or less irrelevant with respect to the resolution of of your basis functions and your transport mode. So 
as far as I know, this is like, uh, uh, this is the first, uh, um, speed up result, um, where the, the runtime for time step is completely decoupled from the runtime of the full model for, for a non-trivial problem, a problem that's not constantly or, or, uh, where the profile is matching. Okay. So, um, coming back to our initial title, we mentioned the network in the title. Um, we, we, the, the represent, the linear representation we had earlier, it can actually very nicely be put in terms of the you know, So, as, uh, many of you will probably, are probably familiar with, a, a peak board deep neural network is the setting that we are, we are, um, going to script ourselves to. Uh, B4 neural network is, uh, uh, alternated, uh, composition of its linear maps with, uh, with a nonlinear activation function. And we will, in, in this case, we'll consider, uh, only the ReLU. Um, so this is A sub one to A sub L, uh, composed our, our linear layers, uh, linear maps, which takes, uh, uh, um, some input V, um, of dimension, um, N sub L. And I'll put another vector of, uh, dimension n sub L plus one. And the, the operation is completely linear. So these, uh, A's have, uh, these WLs, which are parameterized, which are, are weight parameters. And depending on the W's, uh, you, you get a different expression for X. Um, so for example, um, if you want to approximate a uh, solution to the PC using a deep for neural network, you can, for, for any given function f, you can find, uh, these, uh, WL weight parameters that approximate that, that, uh, that given function. And the number of parameters is, of course, uh, the, the sum of all the weight values in these matrices. And of course, it's the sum of n sub l times n sub l plus one. So, um, this people neural network, uh, which is supposedly a large network, uh, rep, uh, can be, uh, can be used to replace uh, the notion of full models. So a full model, uh, as we've seen earlier, is just a linear combination of uh, some basic functions. Um, so they could be considered as a one layer uh, C4 deep neural network. Um, so uh, if we have a representation of the solution manifold uh, that depends on some, some, some parameter of data, this data could be, for example, the time variable. Um, these, uh, so for, each uh, F sub theta, you'll have all the weight parameters that depend on theta. So uh, for a solution to your PDD, you'll be able to set, find the set of parameters of the sub L um, so that your um, people deep neural networks, which is defined by these weights, will be, will be able to approximate that solution uh, very well. Now let us assume the special case when the, uh, these weight parameters actually have a low rank structure. So these individual weights in the linear layers that apply uh, up here in your, uh, up here in your linear, uh, um, the linear maps in, in, in your particular neural network, suppose you can find a, a common, uh, linear basis U sub L and D sub L. Um, um, and, and this gamma sub L is now a very small matrix. So if your weight matrices have this structure, then you can form what's called a reduced activation. So these reduced activations are analog of uh, reduced state functions that we saw earlier for their classical case. Um, and you can also reduce uh, our, our linear maps or affine maps um, um, to just the multiplication of this uh, very small. So we can construct what's called the reduced deep map. Um, and this deep network is just a C4 neural network with a very specialized activation function and very small affine transforms instead of a very large one. And, um, so for this F theta, uh, so this parameterized approximation of your solution manifold, we can also find a corresponding, uh, uh, representation in this, uh, reduced setting. And the key here is the number of parameter is uh, going to be going to scale with M sub L times M sub L plus one, which is the size of your gamma, uh, which is the weight weight parameters for this specialized network with a special architecture. And this M sub L and M sub L plus one can be very, very small um, compared to the M sub L, uh, the, the parameters of the, the usual uh, people network. Um, 
but it will be able to approximate uh, the solution manifold just as well, just by using this F of uh, F of theta R, which is a reduced representation. So um, just to just to uh, clarify what what, I, what I'm saying, so the uh, classical reduced model can be viewed as a one layer argument, which was, uh, if you recall, was of this shape. Um, so these betas are essentially trivial weight functions. And these beta functions are, can be represented as a, a when you freeze the, the, the first layer, um, and, uh, uh, in a certain way, then you can represent these basis functions well because of the universal approximation here. Um, so, you can consider the classical reduced model as a one layer RDN. And these one layer RDNs are uh, um, only applicable when you have when you have a solution manifold that has past decaying n layers. So for example, they're exponentially decaying, then one layer RDNs work very well. Classical reduced models are of the class and they work very well. Um, the mass representation, the nonlinear reduced model we had earlier, um, also can be represented as an RDN. Um, and in this case, the solution manifold has a slowly decaying end width, so classical reduced models are out. We cannot use them to represent the uh, solution efficiently. Um, and of course, the one layer RDNs, which are equivalent to classical reduced models, do not apply here either. However, uh, as we saw earlier, the charts are spurs and the wave profile themselves, they might each individually have a fast decaying, rapidly decaying end width. And in this case, we have shown that our, our nonlinear representation, which you can also represent as RDN, they can still give you a, a very efficient parameterization, uh, an approximation to the solution manifold of the third key parameter. And in the machine learning literature, when you have a deep uh, network that is able to uh, achieve something that a shallow, shallow analog cannot, they call it a depth separation. And this is an instance of a depth separation um, in terms of uh, dimensionality reduction. Um, and uh, I guess I forgot to mention that we had like the word distilling uh, in the title. Um, and this is uh, in the machine learning literature, uh, uh, an analogous uh, concept is called a knowledge distillation. So a knowledge distillation is when you have a large network that has, uh, that can describe certain data very, very well. Um, you try to learn from, um, well, learn from that uh, uh, representation of a much smaller network of field parameters that is much faster to evaluate and faster to train. So a uh, reduced speed network is in 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 a in a very high sense. Uh, it's a knowledge distillation technique um, that is specific to to this uh, to this class of problems. Um, any, any questions so far? Um, okay. So, uh, so here's a, a, a little more in, involved example. I won't get uh, too much into the detail, but I mean, let's look at the Burgess equation, right? Um, so we've been mentioning how these characters, the curves could have a, a low dimensional approximation, but if you take an initial condition that is a simple monotone decreasing function, and it's, uh, it, uh, as it evolves, it, it forms into a sharp wave. Um, so the characteristic curves here are not as regular. So if you look at the, this is the characteristic uh, uh, part of the characteristic curves uh, emanating from various points uh, in, in your domain, and it's propagating. And as you can see that there is a merging of the characteristic curves um, into a sharp. And so if you view this uh, characteristic curves as a, as a map from space to space, you can, uh, you can form this plot. So in, initially, you are working with the identity map. So there's the characteristic curves uh, emanating at these points are not really moving very much. Um, they're, staying, they're staying where they are. And as you're evolving forward, um, these uh, you're, you're adding an, another uh, you're adding another uh, linear sum to uh, a scaled initial condition actually to to your identity. Um, so. The, the transport map uh, is actually uh, increasing a little bit on the left side like this until it becomes uh, a non-monotone function in which, uh, which which corresponds to the fact that the characteristic curves are going to uh, do overlap. So there will be two characteristic curves emanating from a single uh, spatial point. Uh, and after that shock formation, you form this plateau. So this is the, the transport map 
uh, from from your initial uh, spatial domain to the forward spatial domain in the future. And as you can see, there is like a, this plateau that forms and uh, propagates to the left and the right. So what this means is that the the, the transport map map themselves have this traveling structure. So if you go back to the the uh, our our initial example of the advection equation, when when something was moving, um, as there was an interface that was moving, you had a lower bound of n. So now this is this plot is showing that when you have a, a transport map that is evolving like this over time, the transport map itself could also have a, a the collection of the transport maps over time could also have a lower bound on the end. So um, this is an example where characters the curves themselves they have a singular propagating structure. It, so in in a strange sense, the characters with uh, curves themselves are traveling. So there's a traveling feature in the characteristic curve. Um, so in this singular case, there is no hope of constructing uh, uh, essentially the, the nonlinear reduced representation we saw before. So this verge the match representation because your your transport map, uh, there's no hope of constructing a low rank transport map there because you're now your characters curves themselves are singular. So um, we, it's like a, it's a sort of a layered approach. So if you start with a one layer reduced network um, and you see that your Komogor bandwidth is teaching slowly, there's no hope of constructing a reduced solution. But if you compose it with a transport map that is low rank, there are cases where that uh, that gives you an efficient uh, uh, representation. And now in this case, in the singular case of the vertical equation, uh, when, when there's shock formation, um, now you run into the same problem in the inner layer for your transport map. So you have a lower bound of the coma over M width, in which case this uh, transport map itself cannot be approximated in a lower manner, in which uh, case you actually can add more layers. Um, so I won't get into the details because uh, it gets uh, a little bit very complicated, but this plateau essentially is also a traveling, uh, traveling structure, either right? traveling structure. So it's, uh, it's something transferring to the right. So if you actually uh, subtract off the identity, you can see that this is an interface moving to the right. So it is, this itself is also a transport dominated object. So we can approximate this separately with the, with the uh, inner layers of your uh, reduced network. And essentially, we can prove that there is this uh, 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 small parameter approximation. So for approximation of error of epsilon, we can construct the RDN, reduced to network, where, whose number of parameters scales like uh, a log of epsilon, which, which is very small. OK, so any questions so far? OK. so. Um, switching gears. So this is uh, uh, all in um, single spatial dimension, where you have this notion of uh, method characteristics. But as, well, as soon as you go to uh, even a linear problem about variable speed in multiple dimensions, you lose this uh, notion of uh, characteristic curves. Now, of course, there's there are special cases when you have like a high frequency limit and you're doing complex dimensional topics. But uh, in the gen in general, uh, such notions do not exist. So um, here is an integral transform, the red on transform, which could be um, helpful in that case. So the red on transform um, expressed here is just an integral of your multidimensional function f um, along some hyperplane. So in 2D, let's say you have a 2D function uh, whose contours are the circles given here. Um, the red on transform is just an integral over all possible straight lines. And this line is uh, parameterized by the Omega, which is the normal direction of your, your, your line, and S is the distance of that line to, to your origin. So you're transforming by integrating your function F, and this transform variables, the radon variable, are the omega and S, uh, which are just the angle and the opposite. So if you take uh, this, this S, uh, which is this uh, uh, 2D function, if you apply the radon transform, you get another function in 2D, where this omega is parameterized the orientation and that's the option. So you get these uh, sinusoidal looking uh, waves. I think it's very, very contrastful for two points. And this is a, 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 a model famously used for uh, computerized tomography. Um, it appears uh, regardless of the uh, 
computerized model problem in, in the early 1900s uh, introduced by Redon. And the key interesting property of the Redon transform is that it intertwines the partial derivative with the univariate derivative. So if you have a partial derivative of f respect to the i variable, um, if you uh, apply the Redon transform to that term, you always get a derivative in, in f. So s was the offset variable uh, multiplied by some some, uh, some scalar value. So um, for example, if you have uh, a multi-dimensional um, affection equation, uh, you have q plus alpha, because this alpha is the direction of the propagation, uh, dotted with the grad of u. If you apply the Redon transform to this equation, you get an equation here, uh, which is uh, the, the the time derivative of your Redon transform is equal to some scalar multiple. Now, the scalar is alpha times the omega, which is the angle of your of your hyperplane, uh, times the Redon transform derivative of respect to f. And this is a 1D adduction equation. So you can take a multi-dimensional um, transport equation, and once you apply the Redon transform, it becomes a 1D adduction equation, except that uh, you get a family of them for each angle. So in a way, you're doing a planar decomposition of your multidimensional transport problem. And in each direction, you're solving a 1D advection equation. Um, and once you've solved it for each direction, you can transform back and uh, get the solution. Um, so for example, this uh, imagine uh, your, your advection equation is taking this red pulse to this blue pulse. The red pulse is going to be given by, the red on transform of that is given by this, this red function over here on the left. Um, and the matter of obtaining the, the solution after, so if you apply the 2D red on transform, I mean 2D uh, advection equation in the 1-1 one, one direction, it's just going to propagate this pulse over here. And on the radon variables for each angle of slice, you're only moving uh, the contour of the slice uh, in uh, a note, uh, in a certain speed. The speed will be different for each direction, but it's still a constant. Um, while it's the, that, that might be that itself is not very exciting uh, for, for the transport equation, the same principle applies for the 2D uh, acoustics equation. Uh, in the interest of time, let me jump to this uh, diagram. So again, we have the Redon transform of uh, these two pulses. And so these two uh, register as uh, these uh, sinusoidal waves on the, the Redon code. And so, um, if you look at this slice, um, you, you see you see there is this one hump. And um, so, as you evolve the time forward, if you go forward in time, uh, evolve the wave equation forward in time, um, then um, the solution on the in the physical variables looks pretty complicated. And there is no hope of constructing a transport map as we did in one D that maps this to to this um, in a very simple. Way. Um, in a, in a low rack way. Um, actually, you can, you can prove that there, it, that, that is not possible. Um, however, if you look at the, uh, evolution in the rhythm variable, for a fixed angle slice, this hump is simply, uh, two, two humps separating to left and right and traveling. So if you do some characteristic variable, uh, transformation, then you can separate this into just a one hump movie. So all the 1D, uh, apparatus we developed earlier, actually can be applied to the 1D slices of the Redon transform of your um, And this uh, idea of, um, of computing a low rank uh, um, transport approximation in the Redon variables is, uh, it has been actually studied uh, by uh, people in, in image processing. Um, although they weren't really applying it to, to wave data, um, although they're in relation to the physical uh, uh, differential equation. Um, and this uh, representation, uh, let me go slide back, it's also called the Lax Phillips translation representation, um, which was used in their scattering theory uh, in 1964. Um, okay, so now we arrive at the issue of uh, efficient computation of the deep speed Radon transform to, to actually exploit this uh, computationally um, to go beyond the constant coefficient case. We, we do need an efficient way of trans, uh, applying the Redon transform and, and uh, finding the inverse. Um, however, uh, unlike the unlike the Fourier transform, um, the, the discretization of the Redon transform is a little harder. 
um, in, in the sense that it is not a uniform unitary uni uni transform. Um, it's a singular values due to decay for that operator. So um, I've been looking at the, this uh, uh, fantastic actually transform uh, called the approximate of that on transform, which uh, discretizes uh, what's called the digital line. So instead of uh, uh, um, integrating over a straight line, um, what ADRT does is uh, it looks at so these uh, digital lines where the slopes are uh, slopes are broken up um, by by some um, binary expansion, and so these lines look a little broken. Um, so these digit and these, but these digital lines have a recursive uh, property, which allows you to uh, compute um, the, the, the summation over these digital lines in, in a fast way. So O of n log n um, optimal accuracy. O of n squared log n for image of size uh, n squared. Um, so this is what a random transform looks like. So, uh, so at each uh, iteration, let's say your image uh, looks like this. Um, it's a it's a recursive process, so um, I don't think I have time to get the details. But but at each, each level, you you form a summation of broken lines of uh, twice the length from the previous step. So in the end, you get an approximation to the the red eye transform of the full 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 line. And these are just a summation of the pixels that uh, 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 that lie in these uh, so-called digital lines, which are close enough to to the straight lines, but but are are uh, they have this uh, jagged uh, broken structure. So if you take the for example the full ADRT of uh, this Jeffrey Logan Phantom, then you get a picture that looks like this, um, and uh, um, this is an approximation to the continuous transform. So what we saw earlier didn't have uh, this uh, changing uh, wedge shape. All you have to do is uh, stretch them, um, analyze them in a corresponding way, and then you can approximate the continuous reference transform if it's a discretized version. And what's uh, really interesting about this uh, discretization is that uh, uh, William Pratt um, at UT Austin actually uh, found that it could be inverted to uh, uh, machine precision using a full multi grid method. Um, and this sort of accuracy is not usually uh, expected from uh, the computer computerized tomography uh, community. Um, and um, wondering why that was happening, we are, I actually discovered that this actually has a very uh, actually has an algebraically exact inversion form. So among all the discretization for the uh, the Redon transform, this is the only one um, discovered so far that has an exact inversion form. Um, and we also can use that inversion formula to characterize the range. And this is very important for uh, you know developing fast algorithms to approximate approximating the red on transform to exploit the the, uh, the intertwining property. Um, right. So um, I think I am about out of time. Um, so the summary is that uh, there is this uh, depth separation for reduced depth networks for nonlinear hyperbolic problems, even in chunks. You can represent them very efficiently with few parameters if you use uh, this particular um, deep network with a low rank code structure. And this also generalizes to multiple spatial dimensions, and these are essentially a generalization of uh, the classical lax Phillips representation by applying the, the red on trust. So these are some references. So the depth separation appears in this paper, uh, mass was interested in this paper, um, so the red on transform and lax Phillips uh, was considered in, in a separate paper. And the exact ADRT formula, uh, this is actually a very short page paper uh, appears here, um, which gives you a fast uh, approximation to conversion formula. And recently, we, we uh, characterized the range. Um, um, so these are the references. Um, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Don uh, Thank you so much for a very nice presentation. OK, this is a, a Q&A. Session. Uh, we have around eight minutes. Um, I see no questions in in the chat room, but uh, please, um, you know, um, step up uh, if you have any questions. You can speak out. Well, so the basic. This is Jerome uh, Solberg. The basic idea, I think, is that um, in order to do these. Uh, Manifolds, um, 
you need, um, in other words, the advection problem. You you can't use a uh, a linear reduced basis. You need to use what essentially is a quadratic basis in some sense, right? Yes. Right, right. And and then you showed basically that um, that for the Burgers equation, you need what essentially is one more, so like a cubic representation. Uh, um, actually, it's uh, it purely in terms of layers, you need a little more than that. Um, remember, there was this inversion operation in it, so you have to implement that. But uh, if you, yes, yes, exactly. So if you block them into, let's say, uh, block layers, then um, one layer is needed for the, is corresponds to the linear, linear case, and two block layers uh, are required for the smooth, uh, smooth affection. And um, if you have singular characteristics, then you need, uh, I think you need four block layers. I think I ended up with four, but, but uh, four is sufficient, I guess. Four is sufficient. Yeah. And that's, that singular, um, those are, I mean, I'm trying to think about this in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, instead of like singularities caused by like the Burgers equation, like shocks, but in some sense it's like, somewhat like um, when you have, uh, you know, multiple bodies impacting. I wonder whether you, right. know, that you could characterize how many of these things you would need to some extent based upon the number of independent bodies. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting problem. Um, so um, I guess uh, uh, when, you're, when, you're, when you have particles and their trajectories are singular, as in if they hit an object and they, they uh, bounce off to a different direction, then um, that's representing right. that. People is, banging uh, on my door. Uh, so, so that's an interesting question, huh? Yeah, that I, I believe it is. Um, what's uh, yeah? There, there's lots of interesting uh, results about the uh, approximation properties of deep networks. So, um, what what gives uh, what gives us a little bit of hope of handling these uh, these types of singular singular uh, trajectories is that if you have, even if you have a lot of them, if the if the angles have some sort of a similarity. Um, uh, the ReLU people, or ReLU networks, are able to uh, create these jagged approximations in a very efficient way. Um, so um, I think there's a paper by Yaretsky which has exactly this uh, this paper. So if you have like a um, a singular uh, uh, a singular trajectory, but there's a lot of uh, similar ones occurring at different spatial locations, um, I think you can approximate that very well uh, with a um, well, well, at least in theory, with a with a deeper network rather than a shallow one. Right. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. Well, um, no, thank you. Maybe I'll uh, write you later. Okay. Thanks so much. Good. Sounds good. Um, any other questions? Uh, I have one. Um, can you? Um, what what do you envision uh, for your future direction after this? I, I see all, a lot of examples. Oh, I see. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, multiple ways that we're looking into it. So here's a uh, so the the diagram that we had for Matt. So this is kind of like uh, um, this is kind of like the, the three components that we need. So I guess like in the offline phase, we were able to somehow construct. Uh, the inner layers, um, like these weight matrix approximations, the low rank approximations in the inner layers somehow, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a difficult problem. I mean, I, I showed like an example where this could be uh, computed very easily, but computing them in general is, I think, a hard problem. Um, and for the, and actually they need to have this uh, transport, sort of tra transport subspace structure. So these low rank representations are what allows uh, this uh, during the online stage to manipulate your um, um, reduced deep network approximation by adjusting only a few parameters, right? So, so what, what we want is not just uh, some deep network approximation, but we've got a deep network approximation that we can plug into a PDE and uh, evolve the reduced system in a in a in a way that the number of uh, 
number of operations you have to do does not scale with the full system, right? So um, what we are trying to do is uh, we for constructing this is a huge problem, and it's actually where um, I, I think you know you you, you already have some expertise in uh, uh, training these convolutional uh, encoders to extract this low dimensional um, low dimensional um, representation of your solution manifolds and. What I'm looking into now is what is the relationship between um, uh, a comm network, the ZC and Enter, they train really well. And um, as I've already seen in your paper and, and uh, a group of uh, people working on this, the, the convolutional neural networks have this advantage of being able, very easy to train. And they're very stable and they're very effective. So how can we take a trained convolutional network and find an RDN representation of that network is something that uh, we're looking into. So if we could do that, then that, uh, that corresponds to like the first half of the problem. Um, and uh, I guess like a, a, the first bullet of the problem. And the second bullet is to how to how evolve these. And so these RDNs have this lower rank structure. And what we believe is that when you um, hit this RDN with a derivative um, and you use backprop, we can apply like a sort of a empirical interpolation for each layer of the uh, approximation. So whether we can do backprop in a very efficient way and you know uh, find an evolution equation when you plug these things into the PDE, I think that's like another important uh, direction to look into. And uh, I, and uh, I think that also ties with uh, the way that uh, these um, um, these deep networks are are it can be plugged into these, uh, it can form a functional essentially to, to solve the PDEs. So um, tying this idea of low rank uh, weights with, uh, 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 with a, with a back prop and uh, forming, a, uh, forming a minimization problem that you can solve for, for, uh, for these RDNs is actually another, another direction. Um, yeah, so oh, wait, I, I guess that, that, that actually includes two bullets two and three. But it's it's somewhat been done. Um, I guess for the autoencoder, the, the first part is uh, works very well. I, I, well, at least at least uh, to my knowledge, I think the con the convolution uh, autoencoder work um, works really well with the uh, with the training. However, to get the speed up at the online stage is is a, still a non-trivial problem. I, I believe uh, you you have made some progress on that uh, and. Uh, but it's still, I think, uh, uh, many people are kind of considering that problem. So we have like the reverse problem, I think. I think if we have the, the if we've constructed these RDNs, then I think it's a much easier problem to actually plug them into PD and solve them. However, constructing them is still a non-trivial problem. I don't think anybody in the machine learning community has looked at training these RDNs from snapshot data. So it's a huge open problem where these are as as trainable as as uh, convolutional neural networks mm -hmm. are. Um, I mean, the whole revolution started with the convolutional neural nets because they they train so well. Um, mm -hmm. So there is uh, this complementary uh, strength in, in both directions, and and I think so. If we could somehow borrow the trainability of the convolutional neural networks by turning them into the RDN and involving them. Maybe I think that's a promising direction. So that's kind of where we're headed. And uh, yeah, so so the um, and lastly, the the red on transform. We're trying to um, build an efficient implementation um, and try some things in multiple spatial dimensions. Um, for example, variable speed uh, in two D. So we're trying to see if uh, all of this carries through in, in two dimensions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don yeah. I'm, um, I'm looking forward to um, the new results in the future. I'm uh, sounds <laughs> I very, well. exciting. I, I... Sounds very, <laughs> sounds very exciting. Uh, I think uh, it's time is up. Um, it's um, thank you. Let's thank again uh, for the today's speaker, Don uh, Thank you so much for coming and give a wonderful talk. And a few announcements before we, um, you know, adjourn. Um, our next, uh, the seminar, uh, the DDPS seminar series will be next week. Um, um, it's unusual. We usually meet every two weeks, but uh, we will have another week, uh, another, another seminar next week, uh, due to, uh, the Thanksgiving break. Um, so 
So please uh, join us next week and we'll meet again. Until then, um, bye. <laughs> Thank you, Donsa. Thank you.